finalize or not finalize, show you all what we have is uh, the final presentation and trying to answer your questions and facilitate the conversation in a way that allows us all to to learn and um, to learn and, and, and communicate with each other about this important issue. So I hope it's a dynamic discussion and learning <laughs> session. Next slide, please. So this individual return of results work started back in 2013 to 2017. As many of you know, we released a toolkit back in 2017 and then in 2021 revisited where we needed to make updates releasing a whole website on this in 2022. And then the case studies came out in May. Um, we had our webinar on that, and now we're doing this Digging Deeper series to really dig deeper. Next slide, please. So just so that you make sure that you also orient or ground in the individual return of results work itself, this website, I'm gonna quickly just show that there's lots of tools that you're able to come to. If there's ways that we start talking about returning individual results that you have questions about, there are resources on the website that will help you do that. So on the next slide, you'll see that we're talking about how to get started and why to get started. So building that rationale potentially with your teams or in your organizations. On the next point, we're talking about roadmaps for different stakeholders, whether you're in industry or you're the IRB or you're a research study team sort of how, what to return, how to return, and sort of result-specific guidance. And then at the next point, we have all these additional resources that are including tools and templates, um, guidance for participants, uh, the, the original guidance from 2017 that you can look back to, and of course, these case studies. On the next uh, slide, you see that we had these five um, cases that came out. And today, on this next slide, we're gonna talk with Paula and Paula Boyles is here from Pfizer to tell us a little bit more. She'll walk us through again, the experience that Pfizer has had in um, coming to up with this participant data return solution. And we'll also be able to have now some discussion and questions after. So without further ado, let me welcome Paula Boyles. Welcome Paula. Thank you Sylvia. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to come back and um, actually be able to um, talk further on this and, and, and share some further information. So, um, so as Sophie mentioned, um, I'm Paula Boyles. Um, I'm the program lead for external clinical trial data sharing at Pfizer. And so one of the key initiatives that we are focused on currently is participant data return. Um, so essentially returning an individual's data, their clinical trial data back to them um, at some specified time. Um, before I dive into the, the case study and, and do a quick recap of that, um, I'm very pleased to share that um, in June, um, just a few weeks ago, um, Pfizer actually released individual data for two studies. Um, and now we're moving into the phase where we're beginning to return data to individual participants for C when phase two through four studies for US sites. Sí, a las cinco, um, returning that data back at the end of the study. So Importa very ya. excited to share. Gracias. Okay, um, so let's um, quickly dig into the, the case study again. I'll, I'll give a a quick recap um, of that. So we started off with um, with our planning phase, um, and really that was Paula, Paula. Can I pause you for one second? Sure. I'm getting some feedback from the audience that there may be a little bit of audio um, challenge. So maybe if you move a little bit closer to your mic, um, sure. it might be a little bit better for folks to be able to hear it. Um, so that would be perfect. And if everyone else could please keep themselves muted, I know it's very challenging <laughs> so that we're able to um, continue the conversation. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Paula. And thanks okay. all for your patience. Okay, let's, let's try this. Does that sound a little better to folks? Sylvia nodding, you guess. <laughs> I think so, yes. I think it's just being closer to the yep. mic as well. Okay, I, so, I will yeah, be <laughs> getting <laughs> Okay, so. Um, so we started off with um, with a planning phase, um, and here we were really looking at getting buy-in from the organisation 
Um, and that was really from top level down and across divisions because the scope and impact of returning data um, reaches across many, many different um, departments and groups, um, organizational lines in the companies. So it was essential that we got that buy-in from everybody from the beginning. Um, once we had that buy-in, the next step was really um, carrying out some market research to inform and shape what our data return solution might look like. Um, now, the market research consisted of a number of healthcare providers. Um, we had patient advocate groups. Um, we also had past study participants. So it was a range of people. And we were looking to answer questions such as, you know, what data do you want to see? How would you like to see it? When would you like to see the data? Um, what form would it be most useful? Um, all those, those kind of unknowns that, that we went into this with. Um, and what we learned was that people wanted us to share as much usable data as possible. Um, they wanted it presented in a format which was easy to understand um, and easy to share. Um, and they also wanted the ability to be able to potentially upload it to electronic health records um, and print it. So, um, with all that information, we selected um, PDF as the format that we were going to move forward with. Um, it was also made clear that whatever output we have, um, it must be easy to read, it must be easy to understand, um, and visually appealing um, with the use of you know, a combination of graphs and tables, um, just to really um, clarify the data and, and make it digestible. Um, and the timing of returning the data was also important. So, you know, we, we, we hear a lot that um, people want to see their data as they are progressing through the clinical study. Um, there are challenges that come with that. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we have to be careful not to um, return data at a time that could impact the integrity of the study, could potentially unblind the study. Um, so careful consideration went into when we should return our data um, and we decided that um, as a first beginning step we would return data at the end of the study. Um, so once we had all these decisions in place we moved into the build phase. Um, now the build was broken down really into three pieces. We have the creation of the data return file itself. Um, we have the technology infrastructure piece of, of how it all works behind the scenes. Um, and then we have the participant experience, the, the um, user access to actually receive their data. So um, when it came to the infrastructure of how we were going to do this, we um, tried to use um, systems and tools that we already have in place. So we are pulling our data from our clinical data analysis and reporting system where all of our trial data is collected. Um, we are using scripts to populate a PDF template with each individual's data. And then once those PDFs have been QC'd, um, the, re the PDF report is released and stored in a very secure area. Um, within Pfizer. And it's from that area that the data can then be shared um, with the individual participants. And the participants themselves do this using a Pfizer clinical trial alumni portal. Um, and again, that portal is something that we have had in place for, for many years. Um, and we are um, utilizing that and, and, and we've, we've expanded that a little to um, allow for um, individuals to receive their study data as well. So during enrollment, uh, we have study sites providing um, materials to the participants um, that explain how they register for the alumni portal. Um, and then the participants can go create an account, um, and essentially they opt in to receive their data. So they have to click to download um, data um, if they choose. Um, 
And the most important thing here is that, that this data is returned in a very secure manner um, and in a way that protects the individual's privacy at all times. So Pfizer, as the sponsor of the study, does not know who the participant is. We have no access to that information. Um, and even though we are returning individuals' data, um, it is blinded to us. Uh, we, it's, we, we use codes, we use participant ID numbers as opposed to individual personal names, data, et cetera. So personal privacy is, is, continues to be um, protected. Um, so um, I have a slide here which can just um, give you a just give you a, an idea of, of what the alumni portal looks like from an end user perspective. So uh, you see the, um, the the home welcome page. Um, you have option to register um, for first time um, participants or log in once you've already registered and created your account. Um, and the portal, as they, is something which has been in place for a number of years. Um, so not only can you now receive your individual data via this method, um, but there's also um, other features such as you can get the aggregate summary results, the plain language summary from the study, um, and also um, you know, further additional and support resources um, for the study that the participant is, is taking part in. So, um, and if you just go to the next slide, um, this is just a, again a, a little deeper into the tool. Um, you can see, you know, there are options to download the cover sheet for the study, the plain language, um, and there's now the um, the option to download your own individual data. So, um, it's not something we um, are forcing participants to receive. Um, it's not mandated. Um, you have the choice to click on the button to, to opt in and get that data or not. It's a personal choice. So. Okay, so with that, um, once we've done the build and we actually had a solution in place, um, the next key thing was to really um, operationalize this to, to, to get it um, not just released from a technology perspective, but get it embedded within the organization um, so that it becomes part of our day-to-day -day, um, clinical trial reporting. Um, and the change management is really essential because that's, that's the make or break of the success of the project. Um, you know, if we can't institutionalize this and get people using it um, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis, you know, for every study, um, it's, it doesn't have the same value. Um, so uh, so we are, we're currently working through, um, you know, actually getting this embedded into our day-to-day -day process. Um, we're updating some of our processes and policies to, um, to incorporate this. So it will become part of the standard operations for the study team. Um, because this is something um, which, teams need to be thinking about early in the study development process. Um, we're introducing um, something we refer to as a disclosure and data return plan. Um, this is really what the study teams will use to um, define specialized data that they want to be returning, you know, the, the primary outcome measures for a specific study. Um, there's lots of standard data that we're returning across all studies but there will be um, you know, very study specific data and this, this data return plan will allow the study teams to define that. Um, and that will be done up uh, early um, in the clinical development and protocol development um, phases. So um, you know, we will start thinking about returning data right at the beginning um, of the study. Um, and so I think that the last piece of the, of the case study is really um, you know, we're, we're not, um, we're not there yet. <laughs> As I said, we, we've just started um, returning data for, for two studies and we're now beginning to ramp up and return for, for phase two through four. Um, but it's just the first step. Um, so moving forward, we're going to be looking at returning, you know, additional data types. 
um, types like you know potentially imaging files themselves, um, potentially genomic data. Um, we'll also be looking at returning data in the EU and rest of the world. So if you recall at the beginning, I mentioned we're just returning data for the US studies right now. Um, but as we move into later this year and into 2024, um, the hope is that we will begin to return data for EU studies as well. Um, and um, we, we'll also be looking at, you know, timing of, of returning data. So do we continue to do it purely just at the end of the study? Or are there opportunities to begin returning data earlier, potentially during a study? Um, you know, can we return screening data? Um, so there's, there's considerations um, to, to be made there as well. Um, and then the last thing, we're also looking at alternate ways of returning data. So whilst we're using our alumni portal now, um, are there other other ways we could do this, such as you know integration to electronic health records, um, using mobile apps that are out there, similar tools. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, there's, there's certainly a lot more um, a lot more work to to come in this space. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention um, is that you know it's exciting that that Fries is now returning data. Um, but that's not enough, you know. So we we're working with um, you know other groups, industry consortia. You know, we've partnered with MRCT here today. Um, we sit and, and work with Transcelerate, um, who are developing tools such as a considerations guide, um, supporting templates, um, socialization materials, um, really to help support companies get started in returning data. Um, and we also sit on the IMI Facilitate Initiative, um, which is really focused on looking at a framework for data return, specifically in the EU. Um, so there's a, a lot of good work coming out um, from there too. Um, so there's, there's lots of work going on in this space. It's, it's, it's very exciting and um, it, is, it is continuing to evolve on a very rapid basis. So, um, so that's so that's our solution that we came up with. Um, and we can we can talk about some more details in the QA. Um, but I'm sure one of the things that's on people's minds is like, you know, oh, this is a great solution, but what does it look like? <laughs> so I have a few slides here um, that I can um, that I can share to um, really give you an idea of what the end report um, looks like to um, for each participant. Um, and I will start off by saying, please don't um, focus on the content of the data here. This is a totally fictitious report. Um, it, it has no true medical meaning. So don't get hung up on, on the data that you see. Um, but I'm showing this really to give you an idea of, of what it looks like and, and the ways that we're presenting the data back. So, um, so we start off with um, really just a summary of the study, um, protocol numbers, study title, which is pulled in from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and you'll also see that there are some links. So here we have a plain language study results summary link. Um, so throughout the document, we try and provide links to supporting material to help with the comprehension um, of, of what people are seeing. Um, okay, and then we move on to personal um, data for the participant. This is a good, just a good confirmation that they're, they're looking at their own data. <laughs> I mean, all of these are QC before they go out. So, um, okay, next slide. Um, Okay, here um, we're looking at the treatment arm, um, and um, this seems to be the most important thing that people are, are, are wanting to know. You know, did I receive drug or did I get placebo? Um, and we then, we then focus on adverse events. Um, and again, you can see hyperlinks here. Um, we do reference Medline um, throughout the document. Here we, we, we're looking at the medical encyclopedia just to provide resources if there's any medical terminology that people see that they don't understand. Um, that you know they can they can reach out and and look up some of this. 
And you will also see um, that throughout the document, we um, are referring people that if they have any questions, go and talk to your healthcare provider. Um, thinking about the timing of this, um, the report is going out 12 months after the study has completed. So sites are not still functioning operational in many cases. Um, and um, obviously, we, Pfizer, do not know who each of these individual participants are, so we can't have them reaching out to us. Um, so um, we, we refer um, participants to go and talk with your healthcare provider for any questions. Okay, next slide. Um, yep, so we, um, we talk about the primary outcome measures. This is obviously you know, specific for every study. There's a general in introduction describing what a pri primary outcome measure is, um, and then we get into more detail of what specifically um, the, the primary outcome measures were for the study. Um, so again, we've got vaccination symptom diaries here. Um, this is in a, a tabular form, um, obviously. If we go on to the next slide, um, again, more presentation in tabular form. Um, the healthcare utilization. Um, we have some um, um, some lab results. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So we're presenting um, we're presenting the uh, conmed um, and again tabular form. We have uh, medical history reported back, and you'll still see you know further links here um, for supporting information. Um, go to the next slide. Okay, now we start to see a different representation of, of data. Um, so we, we do use graphs as well, um, where we're presenting um, you know, a number of points over time. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, you can see use the further graphs here. So we also introduce color um, to show normal ranges um, of the data of, of each test that you're looking at here. Um, low points, high points. Um, so hopefully it's it's in a nice, clear format that people are able to easily understand. Um, okay, next slide. Um, yep, yeah, uh, and again, so we we, we have um, some non-drug treatments here. And then finally, the last page is really just a, a summary of um, the resources of where people can go to get further information. So we refer people to clinicaltrials.gov um, for full information on the study. Um, and then also a repeat of the, of the link to the plain language um, results summary. So, um, and most of all, thank you for <laughs> the participants. You know, without, without the participants, these studies would not happen. So, um, so um, with that, um, I think we're good to open it up for questions, Sylvia. Yes, that sounds wonderful. So we can um, stop sharing slides right now. And I see the chat is wild with questions. So I'm going to start. I've been kind of trying to organize them. So let me just start to ask. One of the questions came from Christine about just like at the end of study, you're returning the results. Is it post CSR release, the clinical study report release? Um, what's the what's the end of study uh, yeah. time? Uh, yeah. So um, we are returning results um, 12 months um, post primary completion date. Um, so it is after the clinical study reports have been released and finalized. Um, and we chose that timing of 12 months because we wanted to align it with our um, plain language summary um, results being released as well. So. Um, 12 months post PCD, we will release the, the, the plain language aggregate results and the individual results at the same time. That's the whole <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So there were a few questions that are coming around um, sort of deciding what is usable data. So mm -hmm. what's usable data? And there seems to be some question. It was Annette Schmidt who had a question around like, there's a lot of discussion right now about what's valid, validity of data. Um, so how do you decide what's what's the usable data to share? Well, 
that's always a tricky one because as a sponsor, I mean, I personally feel that it's not for us to decide what's important and what's not to a participant. Um, so we we decided to return as much data as we we possibly could. Um, mm -hmm. We did decide we're only going to be returning the primary outcome measures um, because that's the that's the data that we we, we have um, clearly you know defined at lockdown um, the end of the study. Um, so um, we were really we tried to return as as much data as we possibly can. Now I, I did mention. Um, there are some things that we aren't returning. Um, so at this stage, we are not returning um, the individual imaging files themselves. Um, we do return a, um, a tabular format of, of the interpretation of those imaging files. So we do return the results of, of the, um, from the imaging, but not the physical files themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And again, in the future, something we may do, um, but we felt like just returning the results was probably the most important at this stage. Um, the other thing we are not returning right now um, is genomic data. Um, and that was really, um, really because of the, um, the complications and the additional support that's going to be needed if we start returning um, genomic data. You know, that's not something we, we just want to hand over to somebody in a report at the end of the study you know that that requires some um you know some some further support genetic counseling availability etc um and i know you have a great case study on that already sylvia about <laughs> returning genetic data so uh, i say you know go and look at that for, for some more in-depth detail there but um we, we did decide you know that's again something we may look at in the future but right now um, right now no so, so I, I hope that covers the question. <laughs> I think that does a really nice job. I think there'll be follow up if people have more questions Absolutely. on that. But I think that I'm seeing a bunch of questions coming from a variety of different folks. Um, Crystal, Malia, Valentina, a few folks about the participants' actual experience of getting the data, the information, and who can they ask questions to? Um, you know, what if there's something um, troubling in that information or what if they disagree with, um, I mean, there's a few parts here. So maybe mm -hmm. we can start just with, are there folks that people can, that participants can speak to or or how do you recommend, um, you know, participants go forward with that information yeah. that they get if they can? Yeah, so, so, so our, our intent is that the participants will reach out to the healthcare provider. Um, you know, we we we're we're post um, study, at, you know, post end of study at this stage, um, and so um, the, the healthcare provider seems to be the most obvious choice um, for them to reach out um, with any questions. Um, if there's a discrepancy in the data or they disagree with that what they're the seeing in the study report. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Just like, oh, we're doing this together, Paula. We can do this. Um, yes, yeah, so discrepancy in the data. So what we're reporting um, is the data which was reported to and captured from the clinical study site. Um, at the time we're reporting the data, that data has been locked um, in our databases. Um, and we don't go back and unlock those databases when, once they're locked. So really the data is as it's presented. Um, if it was reported incorrectly during the study and it was captured incorrectly during the study, there's really, you know, at this, this stage, there's nothing we can do to go back and change that. Um, it, it's reported purely, you know, as it comes into, um, into the uh, clinical trial management system. Um, and, and at the time that we're returning the data at end of study, um, it's also, you know, we, we have our clinical final clinical study report um, produced. And, and so, uh, you know, there's really no opportunity to go back and start changing data. It's not something we, mm -hmm. we can do. And that's something um, perhaps, if, I'm not sure if you'd if there's anything in the report itself that says that to participants you know that the or clarifies that there, there actually is yes it, it's, it's a page i didn't show in our screenshots yeah, but okay. yes um, at the beginning of the report we do have um 
the kind of like disclaimers, if you like, um, some, some more detail around the data and, and how it's generated. And we, we specifically have um, a section in there that says, you know, we can't go back and unlock the database. And so any, you know, any discrepancies in the data or inaccuracies, you know, really can't be changed at this stage. And so at this point, you've just started doing this, but one question that's come up from um, Jim is around capturing emotional short and long term responses to getting the data. Um, do participants, you know, have an opportunity to share that feedback? Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe that's something you'll think about in the future, but what, how does Pfizer think about that right now in terms of capturing some of the the response that yeah, so, so there's really two different aspects that we look at here um we kind of have the um the, the technology kind of way of capturing things so um you know we, we'll, we'll be capturing um you know visits to the to the portal um logons uh, you know clicks downloads of data that type of thing um kind of like standard um analytics that you can get from websites um, so we will capture that type of data just to see, um, you know, engage the interest um, in, you know, where people like to go and what, what information is, you know, are they are they interested in their individual data or not? So we'll capture that. Um, and then there's more the um, kind of like the personal, the, the emotional side, as you put it. Um, and that's capturing um, more free form um, feedback from our participants. Um, and that's that's something which um, in, in the coming months will be built back into our portal. We, 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 we had um, a way of capturing data and we, we're actually updating that. So um, in the coming months, we'll, we will be able to, um, participants will be able to um, anonymously um, provide feedback and um, we will hopefully capture some, some good insights from that as well. Um, it gets tricky, you know, because as I said, it has to be anonymous. Um, you know, yeah. I, I keep saying Pfizer does not know who each of these individuals are personally. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they're identified purely by a participant ID number. Um, so we have to maintain that, that, that firewall to protect people's privacy. Um, and we do that by having a, a third party in place who actually manages, um, uh, hosts and manages that the alumni portal website. So we we maintain our distance. <laughs> yeah, which is so important, so important. Mm -hmm. So so I think we've captured a little bit about some of that, some of the questions folks had here around patient participant experience a little bit, sort of touching on that. There are a number of questions that are coming up around sort of some of the operational um, regulatory environment around things. Um, so one question was about like CLIA. I'm not sure if you can comment on returning um, sort of results that are research results that are not CLIA necessarily CLIA certified. Um, mm -hmm. Are you able to comment on that at all? Yes. Yeah, so um, again, <laughs> This is this is something which we we do specifically highlight in the report itself, um, because some of the um, some of the tests which are carried out um, are not always um, but are not always done in clear certified labs. You know, for some of the, the research findings that they're done in our own labs. Um, and so we do actually have a clause within the document that states um, you know, some, some of the results um, are done at non-clear certified labs. Um, and because of that, um, they shouldn't be, um, they, they shouldn't be used for, um, as like definitive information for any ongoing care. You know, again, there's reference back to your healthcare provider. It's, it's there as guidance, but you know, you, you really um, can't rely on, on that result. Um, purely uh, without further input from your healthcare provider and, you know, potentially further testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there are some questions also about IRB, and we've discussed a little <laughs> bit about the IRB process. Yeah. So some things, um, questions are coming up, um, like Chris mentioned around what planning goes into, um, how, do you have to mention it um, in the consent form, for example? Like, how have you 
um, approached that um, with this individual return of, of data. Right. Um, so a um, few pieces to this. Um, so IRB approval specifically for returning data, um, that's really something that um, we don't specifically um, request IRB approval in that we are returning the data at the end of the study. It's considered a post-study activity. So, um, you know, IRBs will input on study activities, um, you know, during study conduct. This is considered a post-study activity. Um, however, we do share uh, materials that support this um, return of, of participant data, such as, you know, how to um, create an account on the alumni portal and, and, and details around that. So all of that material is um, IRB approved. Uh, that's something that's distributed by the sites during the study, um, and that does receive IRB approval and all, all that is, is done. Um, in terms of um, informed consent, um, this this is this is kind of a, an interesting one that you know <laughs> we give it, go back and forth on all the time. Um, the consensus is that um, we don't need participants to consent to receive their own data back. That's that's not necessary. So we don't specifically um, state around the return of participant data in the informed consent document. Um, however, participants do have to opt in to receive their data, so it's not something that we are forcing on them. We're not saying, you know, you have to, as part of participating in this study, you have to have your data back at the end. Um, it's on an opt-in basis, so, um, so they, they can receive it if they want to. They don't have to if they don't want to. So while it's not explicit in the informed consent document, um, they do physically have to, you know, go through the opt-in process or, uh, you know, registration and account creation process to get their data back. Um, now it's it's worth saying um, with some of the the studies that we are returning data for, um, these are studies which have been ongoing and. Um, you know, the informed consents were signed numerous years ago. Um, so part of our due diligence is that we do check informed consent documents to make sure that there's nothing in there precluding us from returning data. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a key thing that, that we do need to do. Um, you know, but this is, this is not considered like secondary use of data. This is simply giving individuals their own data back. Yeah. Yes, and so I think, you know, if people have more questions about how the IRB thinks about individual return of results, we are doing another session in August mm -hmm. as well with our Yale colleagues. We'll talk a little bit about sort of uh, the IRB academic perspective on returning individual results and can um, talk a bit more about consent and protocol inclusion and some of the things that um, that others might include in, in that also. Um, kind of leads to one of the questions, which is you're returning at the end. So it's considered an end of study activity, but mm -hmm. what about um, earlier in the study? Is there any thought about if you're gonna ever return data throughout the study or at earlier time points um, and what that, you know, how that might change the the algorithm a little bit for this uh, this solution you it, have right it now? It most certainly would change it. Um, you, you know, if you start returning data during study, you're, you're then, um, you know, you're then required to go through IRB approval uh, to do that. Um, to be fair, it's not something um, we've really looked into in that much detail at this stage. Um, that's, you know, that would be a future activity, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely off the top of my head, that would <laughs> definitely be a requirement um, if you were returning data during study. Yeah, well, there's so many considerations then too about what you could re return and what that means for the integrity of the study and so exactly. on. Exactly, you have to be so careful not to return any data that could unblind you study. You know, that's right. what's, that's the intention. So, and we've got some tools to think about prioritizing what data re to return and how to do so um, <clears throat> on the website as well. And sort of thinking about um, sort of the 
adding the information to the EHR. So there's a question that came up again, sort of around that any feedback you've received on adding the data to the electronic health record. Um, are there groups that are worried about increased risk to their privacy? So that comes from Aneta. And then I received sort of a personal um, message as well from somebody in terms of, um, you know, will that data then be available to sh insurers? And so is there sort of this, which I guess if it's in the EHR, it would be. So let's like start with that EHR question and how you've been tackling that and privacy around it. Yes, yeah, so, so really um, at this point in time, um, it's an individual's choice if they want to take the data and upload it to their own electronic health record. Um, so we provided it in a format which would allow them to do that, um, although that's not essential, you know. So, so really that's a personal choice. If, if there's concerns around insurers, you know, having visibility of that data, you know, that's that's really a, a personal consideration that you should make before you, you upload the data. Um, but um, yeah, at, at this stage, um, you know, it, it's, it's really standalone. Now, moving forward, um, it's something we certainly will look into. Um, you know, are there options to, to, to kind of more automate this? Um, is that something that people want? Or, you know, having the personal choice and having it in a PDF format as we currently do, that may be a better option. So these are all things that, you know, as we move forward, we will investigate further. Um, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely a consideration. Um, you know, people, people need to be aware of what the implications could be before they, they do that. Um, you know, and I, I think the, the, the more that we, we have these opportunities for people, um, the more educated they'll become um, in terms of, you know, what their data means to them and what they can then go on and do with their data and how it can help inform their ongoing health care as they move forward. So, yeah. yeah, data literacy is this huge piece of this too. Mm -hmm. And what the implications are of any data that we collect, you know, if you're doing any kind of testing or anything outside of research or in research that could impact what's in your record then. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come up around why the US um, and are there any, why just the US and was there any EU, were there any EU sites for these US studies or are they exclusively US right now and you've only returned to US participants? You didn't exclude any EU participants at this point, no? Um, so, um, so why the US? Um, really because um, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> The US landscape for, um, in terms of kind of like laws and regulations for returning data um, is a lot more clear cut, a lot more simple. Um, you know, it's, it's uniform across the country. So um, it was an easier place to start. Um, the challenge with the EU and returning data to EU countries is that each member country have different laws and different regulations around the return of data in that specific country. So um, it's more of a challenge to um, assess the landscape and work out, you know, how do we return data to all of the EU participants without, um, you know, breaking any of the of the, of the data legislations um, in place for specific countries. So it, it, it is more of a challenge. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible. <laughs> I spoke about IMI Facilitate um, project that, that is, is looking specifically at that, you know, how can the framework be developed that can return data um, to all of the EU member countries. Um, so it, it's, it's ongoing, but it's, it's certainly more of a challenge than just returning data in the US. So that's why we selected the US as our starting point. Um, for the studies we've returned data for, um, they were not just US participants, there were um, global participants, um, but we have just returned the data for the US participants at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really, just, just because of the, the, the legal. Um, yeah, the practical, logistical, yeah. and you have to start somewhere. And so I think, that's like a really key thing for us to remember because we can sometimes get 
stuck in this idea that well we just if we can't do it perfectly right away then we're not going to do it at all and exactly. we think about this all the time in health literacy too right how do we get things perfect and there's definitely a question here from um one of our one of my work group members in the, on the glossary asking about how you deal with like the health literacy aspects of these reports or the technical terms that might have been sort of what the data was collected as versus plain language and yeah. whether any ways that you had to take that into consideration with the report? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, as we were developing this report, um, it has gone through many, many iterations <laughs> and it's gone through review across many of our groups. So uh, we have had our internal health literacy group review it, provide feedback on it, um, as well as our medical writing group. Um, so we've had input from lots of, you know, lots of um, different areas. Um, and it is a challenge because, you know, we, we hear people want to, to get back as much data as they possibly can. We know they don't want just a data dump because that's not useful at all. There needs to be some explanation, some context around what they're seeing. Um, and then on the flip side of that, the part of the intent of returning individual data is that so they can then take that data, share it with a healthcare provider, and that can inform their ongoing care. So there's a very fine line between making sure that it's simple and understandable enough for the participants, yet you're not losing the medical meaning and context for the healthcare provider to be able to take that and it actually means something to them and, and that was one of the drivers that of why we put in um, a number of links and supporting references that we that we did throughout the document um, that was an attempt at trying to provide the necessary support if there are you know there's, there's medical terminologies in there that, that may not be understood um, mm -hmm. I mean one of the one of the challenges is that we report the data as is. We, we made a decision that we would not change any of the data. So if the data is, is, is reported and it uses, you know, a, a full medical term um, for its name, for example, um, you know, we're not going in and changing that. We're reporting the data as is. Um, so yeah. we then provide the supporting materials to help with the comprehension define things and everything that's yeah. wonderful so helpful um so we're coming towards the end of the time here so i want to make sure i highlight if your question didn't get answered please email me i put my email in the chat and i'll work with paula to make sure your question gets Absolutely. answered um one quick question i think this will be quick because you talked a little bit about all of the pieces that had to be put in place and people are excited christine Sterkler says congrats for you know return of individual mm -hmm. results how long did it take from conception to launch? How big is your team at Pfizer? She wants to get an idea of the resources and efforts behind it. Yes, yeah. Um, so how long did it take? Well, to be fair, the idea has been an idea um, for 10 plus years. <laughs> this is not something new. Um, the desire to do this ha has been around for many, many years. Um, the actual doing of it, once we'd received the buy-in and the decision that, you know, we, we're going to go ahead and do this, um, it, hasn't been, um, it hasn't been a consistent focus, you know, start to finish, wow, we, we get it out the door. Um, it's probably been ongoing um, over maybe two to three year um, period of time, um, but that's not, you know, a full two or three years of dedicated work on it. It's kind of, you know, you start a bit, you pause for a bit, you carry on a little further. You know? So, so um, you know, I, I would say realistically, two years, you know, would, it really depends on the size of the company and you know there's so many factors that go into that you can't say it's, it's, it's going to take x amount of time because you know it, 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 it really depends um and again you know it depends on how many resources you have working on it um right. i said this is a really a true cross-organization initiative um so we have had 
many hands in the pot trying to develop this thing. Um, it hasn't been people working on it full time. Um, you know, we'll, we will have like people come in, do a little piece, and then they'll move on. And you know, so it's 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 very hard to say exactly what the results level has been, um, other than it's broad in terms of scope, you need to make sure that you have all interested parties and all people that are going to be impacted by this um, yeah. involved and engaged at some point. Yeah. And that is noted in the case study, all the different uh, groups that are involved. So please right. look at the case study, folks, and also look back at this website, the Individual Return of Results website the MRCT Center has, which really gives a lot of those startup considerations for getting buy-in, et cetera. Um, I want to make sure we um, wrap up. So if we can just um, screen share again one more time the slides towards the end, please. What we're going to end up doing is just um, reminding you that we just did this last, this was the last one in, August, in July, excuse me. You can still register for Thursday, August 17th, where we're going to talk about the IRB and Human Research Protection Program responsibility and returning results. And also, there were a number of questions about genetics or this, some of these arguments really applying to thinking about the return of genetic and genomic data. So we're going to be having a, a session in September with Megan Prone on genetic testing and individual return of results. Next slide, please. And I just want to make sure I thank everyone who had contributed to this project. The individual return of results project has just been a whole team in 2021 that worked on this and all these other case study authors that helped to start bring this to life. And so, you know, just again, want to thank everybody for um, bearing with us. You know, it was a little bit of a rocky start, but I really feel like in the end, it was all about us being able to see each other and even though you couldn't exactly see each other's faces, we're in this community together, wanting to do the right thing, wanting to do what participants are asking for, which is get access to their data, be able to use it for decision-making and get something back after they participate in, in research and have given of their time and their body. And this is our way to appreciate that. And so I'm so grateful to Paula for being willing to do this with me, this little experiment of this deeper dive um, session and thank you all for your patience and your grace and again if there was a question that you asked that wasn't answered please don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'll do my best to get you um, the answer and the and all of this the video and the slides and other information will be available online um, next week or in August in sometime in August um, for you to be able to then access and share so thank you again everybody and I wish you the wonderful rest of the summer. Um, for those of you here in this hemisphere, I guess, enjoy your winter for those of, uh, those of you in Australia or anywhere else. And um, I look forward to hopefully seeing many of you at the next session in August and seeing your emails in my inbox if you have questions. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Paula. Very welcome. Thank, thank you, Heather. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.